Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to be able to worship together. We pray that your spirit would help us to not only understand the truth of your word, but that you would be able to empower us to be able to see you more clearly. And that we would see that in your word there exists the way to life. And so we ask that your spirit would help us this morning to listen and also to obey. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So I read an article this week. It was an interview with an actor named Viggo Mortensen. He played the character Aragorn in the Lord of the Rings films. He talked about his father suffering from dementia. And his father kept on sharing with his caretakers about a strange incident from his childhood. It was a day he forgot to close a pig pen. Now, everyone thought that the old man was spouting nonsense. He was out of his mind. But then they discovered the truth behind the story. Apparently, when he was a young boy, there was a time when food was rare. And there was one day when he left the gate open. The pigs got out and ransacked the family garden, but he never admitted his mistake. And this guilt had buried itself deep within his subconscious that even though he was losing his memory, he still remembered this mistake. Now, this interview prompted me to think, it made me wonder, why did he not confess to the mistake? Why did he not confess to the sin? Maybe he constructed a lie to avoid getting punished. Maybe he feared his father administering physical discipline. Maybe he worried that his parents would never trust him to watch the pigs again. Maybe inside he knew that this mistake, this sin, would cause people to treat him differently. That this sin would change the way that people perceived him. And if we think about it, sin causes people to treat us differently. If the IRS audits our tax returns and discovers that we fudged the numbers intentionally, then they'll demand a payment of lost taxes and scrutinize future tax returns. If we conveniently forget to send payment to our friend to pay for dinner the other night, then we may not receive a future invitation to another dinner. If a friend discovers that you disclose their secret, then they probably won't share with you another secret in the future. If you demand that your adult children obey every single instruction of yours because your pride insists, insists you know best, then you might experience an estranged relationship with them. Sin affects our relationship with people. It causes people to treat us differently. The relationship changes, it morphs. Now, if we know that people treat us differently intuitively, deep within us, when we sin against them, then how does God treat sinners? How does God act toward those who rebel against him? What is God's response when we disobey his commands? How does God treat the one who has sinned? Now, we know that there are consequences to sin. In our series in Genesis, we learned that Adam and Eve's sin resulted in the curse of sin. Women would experience pain in childbearing. Men would have to work the cursed ground in order for it to yield some fruit. Conflict would exist between man and woman, especially as they try and assert dominance and rule over one another. The world got turned upside down. And this is the result of sin. This is God's justice. Man disobeyed, they paid the price. But this morning, I want to focus on another response. I want to focus on God's grace towards the sinner. That God acts graciously towards the one who sinned against him. He gives sinners what they do not deserve. I mean, God could have immediately executed man and woman for the rebellion. But he doesn't. He allows them to live. God acted with grace toward them. So how does God respond to the sinner? He acts graciously toward them. And we'll see this played out in this morning's text in Genesis chapter 3. 
Uh, if you haven't turned there already, as we had our scripture reading, you'll probably want to turn there now, Genesis chapter 3. And these verses are immediately following the curse in Genesis chapter 3. Now, in this section, we'll see three ways that God graciously provides for sinners. That there are three things that God does that demonstrate his gracious nature. That this text shows us these three actions that God takes, three ways that God graciously provides for the sinner. Let's look at the first way that God graciously treats the sinner. Well, first, God graciously provides salvation to those who believe in him. He provides salvation, a means of being saved to the sinner if they believe, if they trust in him. And if they would believe in God's provision of salvation, then they would be saved from their sin. So God graciously provides salvation to those who believe, those who believe in him. Now let's review what sin is. Now sin, as you remember from Pastor Jason's message last week, finds its origin in archery. When an archer lets loose his arrow and misses the bullseye, this is sin. And oftentimes, we apply this imagery to our failure to act morally. And it's true. If we have a moral code by which we ought to follow, then we oftentimes will find that it's hard for us even to follow our own code. I mean, we believe that we should treat everyone courteously. But when you wait in line at the local Texas DMV to get your license renewed, and someone cuts in front of you, you are going to fight for your position because you don't have another 15 minutes to wait. You have places to be, people to see. And we find ourselves failing to follow even that code to treat people courteously. Now, we fail to follow any code, whether it be our own or even if it's God's because of sin. Now, Jason turned this image on its head because it's not complete. Sin is not just a failure to uphold a moral code. We sin because we take our bow and arrows and we fire those arrows directly at God. That when we look at God's design for flourishing, we decide, hmm, nah, thanks God, but no thanks. We shake our fist at God saying that we don't believe that your design for our life is good, but you are harsh. You are cruel, you are cold, and we prefer to rule ourselves. And so sin is ultimately a rebellion against God. Now let's go back to what I was saying earlier, this idea of God's grace, God's gracious provision, that God graciously provides salvation to the sinner. Now while it's appropriate for a king to execute a rebel, God gives people another chance. He gives them an opportunity to confess their rebellion, to confess their disobedience, and trust in him to provide salvation. It's a return to living under his rule. So let's turn our attention to the text. We'll see in this first verse that we read today that Adam believed that God would provide salvation through his wife Eve. That after hearing the curse, Adam knew that only God could rescue him, and that God's plan for salvation involved his wife Eve. Look with me at chapter 3, verse 20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now, there are two things to note in this verse. First, you have to wonder, why does Adam give his wife another name? His wife already had a name. It was woman. It was out of man. That was her name. But Adam renames her, and this new name, as it says in the verse, means mother of all living. That from her would come other human beings, and Adam anticipated that from these human beings, there would come one, a person who would deliver them from sin's curse. That this descendant would return life to cursed humanity, that he would reconcile God and man. This brings me to the second thing to note, the reason for the name. As I've said already, that Adam knew that a savior would come from Eve's womb because of what God had said earlier. If you look up at Genesis chapter 3, 
verse 15, it says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And this is a promise that the future child of Eve would be the serpent slayer. That God promised that this seed of the woman would overcome the seed of the serpent. And Adam believed in this promise. This is why he renames his wife Eve. This demonstrates that Adam trusted and believed in God, that he would provide salvation through a future descendant. Now, God unfolds this plan throughout the entire Old Testament. We discover later, especially in the book of Genesis, that this serpent slayer will then come from the family of Abraham. At the end of Genesis, we discover that the serpent slayer will not only come through the line of Abraham, but through his great-grandson, Judah. And then later on in the Old Testament, we discover that within the tribe of Judah, that the serpent slayer will come through his descendant, David. And the rest of the Old Testament, Israel is left wondering, who is this future, future serpent slayer, this one who will deliver us from the curse, who will come from the line of David to save us? And we discover in the New Testament that this serpent slayer is Jesus Christ, that God provides salvation through Jesus Christ if you believe. Now, you may know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You may know that Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. You may know that Jesus is a moral teacher. You may know that Jesus died on a cross for sin. You may know that Jesus rose from the dead three days later. You may know that Jesus ascended into heaven. You may even know that Jesus will return one day. But if you do not believe that you're a sinner and that you need Jesus Christ. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross to die the death you deserve, it doesn't matter. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, proving his victory over sin and death, you're still in sin. If you don't believe these things about Christ, if you don't believe, you're still lost. You may know the gospel, but if you don't believe the gospel, then you are still shaking your hand at God, saying, I'm going to live the way I want, even though I know the truth. Now, I remember a conversation with a friend. She shared with me that hearing the gospel moved her heart. When she heard her friend share a testimony, it even moved her to tears. And so when I asked her, so do you believe in the gospel? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? And she replied, no. Because to believe in the gospel would require me to admit that I am a sinner and I need God's help. And I can't do that. And that conversation still echoes in my mind because it reminds me that someone may know the gospel truths and still not believe. And so will you, will some of you, transition from knowing the gospel to believing the gospel? Will you be willing to stake your life on what Christ has done? And for those of you who have known and believed, will you take the step toward baptism? Because baptism serves as a public demonstration to the world that you identify with Christ's death and his resurrection. And that baptism allows us, as a church, to affirm your profession of faith. Because if you have not professed faith in the gospel and taken steps towards baptism, then I would encourage you, think about it. Talk to someone about it. So that's God's first gracious provision. He provides salvation to those who believe. Now let's go on to the second gracious provision that God gives us. God graciously provides a costly covering for sin's shame. God gives clothing to sinners to cover their shame. He provides a new outfit. He gives new garments. And this garment is not cheap. It is expensive. It costs something. God graciously provides a costly covering for sin's shame. And we'll discover this in this text. 
in the following verse, in verse 21, that God provides costly garments of skin to completely cover Adam and Eve's shame. Look at verse 21 with me. It says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Now, why did God make Adam and Eve a new wardrobe? I mean, after the fall, Adam and Eve created their own clothes. They used fig leaves, sewed them together to make loincloths. Now, if you understand the connotation of a loincloth, the loincloth is equivalent to underwear. It only covers the private parts of a person. That Adam and Eve's fig leaves didn't cover enough. They didn't provide adequate coverage for their bodies. Now, it serves as a metaphor for their inability to cover their own shame. It serves as an image for their inability to cover their sin. That their effort and that their work could not hide their feelings of guilt. It couldn't properly cover their shame and their sin. Now, we often try and cover our sins, don't we? I mean, we may think to ourselves, yes, I may gossip about people. I may talk behind their backs, but I attend church. I go to Bible study. I don't swear. I do work on time. My virtuous qualities cover my sin. And yes, we may also justify our sins in another way. Yeah, I may badmouth my boss when he's not around, but he's a hard boss. He calls me at night asking me to work on projects. He takes credit for my work. He requires me to come into the office even though I told him I'm on vacation. His bad deeds require, deserve, justify my scathing critique. And so we try and justify ourselves to cover up for our sin, to say that our sin is justified. Now, note the material of the covering. Adam and Eve used fig leaves. They must have thought, okay, if we're going to use a material to cover ourselves, let's use something that grows back. So we'll choose leaves. But God chose a different material for their outfits. He chose skin. This meant that an animal had to die for their shame to be covered. And every time they wore it, it would always serve as a reminder of the death that would await them because of sin. And it also reminded them that a life was required to atone for their sin. Now, note the type of outfit that God makes for them. God doesn't make Adam and Eve loincloths of skin. He makes for them garments. It says that, says that in verse 21, garments. Now, this word connotates a robe. And we know it's a robe because that same word is used by Moses to describe the ornate robe that Joseph wears, the one that was gifted to him by his father Jacob. And this outfit would cover their entire physical bodies as well as help them to deal with the harsh environment outside of the garden. That God's covering is complete. It is adequate because it covers the entire body. And this garment serves as a metaphor for how God alone can cover one's sin, could cover one's shame completely. That only God can provide complete covering. It's not our work that can cover us. It is God's work that can cover our shame. It is he alone who gives us the new outfit. And we see this idea of God providing garments, coverings throughout the Old Testament. That after the Levites offered an atoning sacrifice for Israel, the Levites would receive skins. And the high priest would also put on a garment to minister before the presence of God. And the prophet Zechariah receives a vision of the high priest Joshua receiving a new garment. Now for us as believers, we know that Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross it is sufficient to cover the shame of our sin. That the Apostle John, in his first letter, talks about how the blood of Christ purifies us from all unrighteousness. 
And that's why Paul oftentimes talks about putting off the old self with its practices and putting on the new self. That God calls us to remove the garments of the old self associated with sin and shame and to receive the new garment that he provides in Christ. So to put on the new garment that Christ provides means that we no longer need to fight to justify ourselves, to cover ourselves, because we can confess that we are a sinner, that we are flawed people, that our significance ultimately is found in Christ, that when we put on our in Christ identity, we no longer gossip because we know that we can trust God, that God knows best. And that putting on the garment of Christ means that we talk less about people, talk bad about them when they're not around, because ultimately, especially if our employer is a bad boss, that ultimately God is our boss. He is the one we work for. And that we don't need to justify ourselves before God, because he will vindicate us. So we see that God graciously provides salvation for those who believe in him, We also see that he provides costly garments to cover sin's shame. Let's move on to the last provision, the last thing that God graciously provides. God graciously provides an end to our sojourn in sin, that we will not live in this state of sin forever, that our days in this cursed world are numbered. Our days in this world our days in this body, that these things are ultimately temporary. The reason being, we are passing through. That God graciously provides an end to our sojourn in sin. Now after God closed Adam and Eve, he expels them from the Garden of Eden. God expels them from the Garden of Eden so that they would not live forever in the state of sin. Because God recognizes that there is a danger, that if mankind was allowed to remain in the garden in their fallen state, and they continue to eat from the tree of life, they they would forever remain in sin and forever separated from him. Uh, Let's look at verse 22. It says, Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now, lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, remember the idea of knowing good and evil. It's not about discerning right from wrong, because Adam and Eve already knew right and wrong before the fall. They knew it was wrong to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the concept of knowing good and evil refers again to this idea that one living their own life the way that they design, the way that they desire, that to know good and evil is to determine for oneself what is right in one's own eyes. And that we determine what is right. We determine what is wrong, not God. Now, recall in the Garden of Eden that there exists another tree near the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is a tree of life. That God created the tree of life so that if man ate of it, the man would live forever. But if man, again, in this state of sin, took from that tree and ate from it, any chance of reconciliation with God would cease to exist. Because a holy God could never coexist with sinful man. So this prompts God to evict man from the garden. That God expels man from the garden of Eden to the east. Uh, Look at verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man at the east of the garden. Okay, of, sorry. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so these verses seem to imply that God cast man out towards the east. Now, I learned growing up in the San Francisco Bay Area, you never go to East Palo Alto. That is the bad part of town. 
Now, it may change because it's getting gentrified, but we learned growing up, you never go to the east side of town. Now, I don't know if it's true here in Houston. You can tell me after service if it's wrong to go to the east side of Houston. Uh, but there seems to be a natural inclination that east is not good. And even in the Bible, anyone heading east is not a good thing. That after Cain kills Abel, he heads east. And humanity builds the Tower of Babel in the east. Lot separates from Abraham. And where does he head? He heads east. So if you're to sojourn, you don't want to sojourn in the east because that would take you far from God. Now, after God expels man from the garden, as I've already read, he stations a cherub to guard the way to the tree of life. This is in verse 24. He placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Now, the Bible oftentimes depicts cherubs as guards to guard the presence of God. God's footstool would be held up by the cherub's wings. And the, on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there would be two cherubs, and the presence of God would be found on the top of it. So it's no surprise that God would set up a cherub to guard the way to the tree of life. But note also the weapon. He holds a flaming sword. And in Deuteronomy, Moses describes this flaming sword as a depiction of God's wrath. That anyone who wants to re-enter the garden to obtain fruit from the tree of life they would need to first face God's wrath. This meant that Adam and Eve would live their lives as sojourners outside of Eden because paradise had been lost. That life would be different outside of the garden. In the garden, they lived on rich, fertile dirt. Anything they plant would grow up and bear fruit. But now they were outside of the garden, and every time they worked that cursed ground, they just longed for good fruit. They would have to guard those fruit trees. They would have to guard against pestilence. They would have to guard if they had squirrel squirrels, because I see squirrels all the time in my garden. And this idea that you would have to protect, watch over, in order for you to produce any type of fruit, it would be hard. It would be difficult. It would be frustrating. And they would long for the day to return to the garden. Now, throughout the Old Testament, God reminds Israel that they are sojourners. Now, if you remember the place where they worshipped, they worshipped at the tabernacle, they worshipped at the temple. Which way does the entrance face? It faced east. So every time they went to worship at the temple, they would have to head west, as if it was a reminder that they were on their way back. To the garden. Now, to further help remind them of this, when Solomon built the temple, it had decor. Now, a lot of us think white walls, maybe marble. No, no, no. Even when you look at the doors to the temple, there were imagery of palm trees and cherubim. When the priests enter into the temple, they looked up at the walls. There would be carvings of cherubim, palm trees, open flowers. Even if you look at the lampstand, it looks like a tree. And before you enter into the inner sanctuary where the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, there would be these two large carvings of cherubim that you would have to pass through to go into the presence of God. The temple reminded Israel you are sojourners. And that God even set up priests to guard the way to his presence, much like the cherub, and that there would be only one priest that could enter into the Holy of Holies once a year, the high priest. Otherwise, anyone else who entered the temple would die. And as Christians, we, under this, we understand the idea of sojourning as well, because we are sojourners in our sinful state when we place our faith in Christ, that we are in a cursed world and we await the return to paradise. Now, faith in Christ dealt with two aspects of sin. It dealt with the penalty of sin. It dealt with the power of sin. That when Christ died on the cross, he paid the death that we deserve. That's the penalty of sin. 
And then when Jesus rose from the dead, he dealt with the power of sin. Because when Jesus rose from the dead, he broke the power of sin. But we still live in these fleshly bodies affected by sin. And we sense the tension between our fleshly desires and the desires of the Spirit. But our life in the flesh, our life in the body, will not last forever. That our sojourn in this fleshly state, in this sinful body, will eventually end. It will end either one or two ways. First, our sojourn in our sinful state will end at our death. That when we die, we will no longer have to deal with our sinful flesh because we await the receipt, we await our resurrection bodies. Now, the second way that we would end our sojourn is if Christ returns. That if he came at this very moment, then we would also receive our resurrection bodies that resemble his own. That we will now end our sojourn and we will experience full freedom from sin. Now, let's turn back to this idea of the tree of life. That we will one day return to paradise to regain access to the tree of life. That according to the book of Revelation, Jesus will grant those who place their faith in Christ permission to eat once again from the tree of life. And that from this tree of life will flow waters that will heal the world from the curse. That creation will experience a complete renewal because the curse of sin is removed. Now let me give you a word of warning. That if you fail to place your faith in Christ, then this temporary sojourn will last forever. That you will live forever in the state of sin. Now you currently experience a separation from from God. I mean, you don't have the resources of the Holy Spirit available to you. You're not able to experience the depth of faith, love, and hope And this separation from God that you are experiencing now will eventually become permanent if you refuse to place your faith in Christ. That when you die, you will experience forever separation from God. And when Christ returns, if you were to turn at this moment, he will cast you far from his presence. Paradise for you will be lost. So what will you do? Will you continue to persist to live according to your design, according to your own worldview? And let me ask you something that Jason asked us to consider. How is that working for you? Do you experience a peace that surpasses all understanding? Do you find freedom to admit your flaws and your sins knowing that God accepts you? How is it going for you? Now, for those of you who are believers, remember that you are passing through. Don't settle in this world. This is not your forever home. Don't pursue the comforts of this world because the things of this world will pass away. Your M1 chip and your MacBook, it will give way to an M2, right? I mean, your current cell phone, its battery will eventually die and you recycle it and you get a new phone. Your sports car, will become tomorrow's junk heap. I mean, your 401k worth millions of dollars could be turned to pennies. I mean, think of inflation or a stock market crash. Your new home will experience wear and tear. That fresh coat of paint after five years will start to crack. That foundation that once was so strong may break. The wood that holds up your house may be food for termites. What you have will pass away. So pursue the things of God. Share the hope that you have in Christ with people. Care for your brother and sister in Christ. Grow in your knowledge of God. Serve one another. Because God will graciously bring this sojourn, this traveling time to an end. And until then, sojourn well. So how does God treat those who sin? He treats them with grace. He graciously provides salvation to those who believe in him. He provides costly covering for sin and its shame. He provides an end to the sojourn 
in the state of sin. So let me end with a stanza from our response song that we'll sing shortly. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. This is what it says. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home. And day by day, I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we recognize that we are sinners. We deal with it each and every day. We know that it affects our lives, our relationships, and it also affects our relationship with you. But we thank you that you are gracious towards us, that you provide for us salvation and covering and hope, that our struggle with sin at this moment will not last forever. And so I pray that your spirit would create within us an anticipation for the day when we will receive our resurrection bodies to be free from sin and to enjoy paradise, the Garden of Eden, once more. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.